Good evening, everyone. And once again, welcome back here to St. Michael's for the third night and final night of our parish Lenten mission with Father Peter Grover. Uh, tonight, Father Peter will speak on how we find happiness in doing what God created us to do. And he's joined this night by a seminarian, Deacon Jorge, who is also part of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, and Deacon Jorge will also be sharing a reflection. We're very excited to continue this Lenten mission with you and invite you now to please stand and join in our opening hymn, You Have Called Us, which is found on the front cover of your program. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Deacon Jorge, and let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you as a family seeking your divine guidance. Help us to love and support one another, and may our family be a source of unity and strength. We ask for your blessings and grace to be upon us always. Amen. Please be seated. So I'm Deacon Jorge. I'm an obligate of the Virgin Mary, and God willing, I'll be ordained this summer uh, to the priesthood uh, out in Southern California at my home parish out there because I'm originally from Southern California. So please pray for me as I continue this journey uh, to the priesthood. It's been a very, very blessed one. But I'm here to give you a, a quick reflection. and. It, it, and I have a, a quick question for you. If I were to ask you, actually, no, I am asking you <laughs> who your friends are, just, just take a moment. Like, like, what faces come to mind? What names come to mind? Do you have a top three? I think the word friend is so misused in our society, or, or maybe not misused, maybe watered down. You know, if you have social media, right? Like if you have friends on Facebook or for you, you younger people, teenagers, you have Snapchat or TikTok or whatever social media things that you use. Are those really friends? You know, maybe those friends that you text occasionally, is that the definition of friendship? 
The definition of friendship is this. It is, it is one of an intimate bond between people, between persons. And for there to be this bond, there has to be vulnerability. And how many of us with all of our iPhones, all of our social medias, and all the ways that we are connected in the world still feel like in part of our hearts that we feel like we don't belong, that we can't be vulnerable? And you may ask yourselves, you know, where exactly do I belong? Especially younger people. Does God love me? And you might, you know, try to do a few things here and there to impress your friends just because people just, as we get older, you know, that doesn't really change. We want to be liked. We want to be noticed. And then there are things that happen in our lives that you say, you know, if you really knew what has happened in my life, if you really knew my story, if you really knew the things that I struggled with, will God still love me? Do I have a place where I belong? And this is where we guard our hearts, our hearts against those places of vulnerabilities. And sometimes when we say we just don't care. And we, when, you know, when people ask, you know, how you're doing and you say, good, fine. But inside you're just like, Ugh, I don't want to admit to how I really am doing. And then some of us had friends that for one reason or another, you're no longer friends. And usually the most common reasons for not being friends is usually because a friend has failed you or you just went different ways. And in all circumstances of life, friends change. It's no one's fault. You know, I had a friend in high school who took a very different path than I did. But we're no longer friends. We changed. Our interests changed. Our desires changed. And then some of you have friends who have failed you. And if you think of Christ on the cross, the failure of his friends, the apostles at the end of his life, it's incredible. Like how in the world did those men who lived with him for three years completely desert him in his hour of need? He was left completely alone when he was tried. He was by himself when he was scourged, crowned with thorns and condemned to death all alone. Because right before the passion, Jesus tells them, I have called you my friends. For I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. And what did they do? They left him. Has this happened to you? Where you were good friends with someone and then something happened, you had a falling out, it was probably really bad, and you just stopped being friends. And you're going to say, you know, I'm never going to forgive that person. Forgiveness is out of the question. Even if they're not sorry, you can always choose to forgive. Forgiveness is heroic. Because, you know, it, it's so easy for me to identify when somebody else has failed me. But my biggest challenge is I can't tell when I failed somebody else. That's really difficult for me to find out, to, to really see in myself. So why do, why, why do, why do friends fail? Why do we fail? because we're human, because of original sin. So thank you, Adam and Eve. But Christ is a friend. He will never, ever, ever fail you. When we go to him to prayer, we have to be vulnerable. It's like, it's like if, you don't let see, if you don't let someone see into your heart, if you don't let Christ see into your heart, then are you really friends? Or are you just acquaintances? We have to share with him everything that's going on. So when I asked you earlier, you know, about the people, about your friends, the names that came to mind, your top three, I'm just wondering, did Jesus make the list? Was he one of your top three? Or do we think Jesus as a friend? Or is that just too close? Like, you know, like, this is me and that's Christ, like, up there. He's a king. I'm not going to, I don't want to get anywhere near him. Because he's just too, no, it's just too much. You might want to be keeping there up there as a king. And some of you might even think, you know, should I even think of him as a friend? Some of you may be struggling in one way or another. Some people doubt with their faith. Maybe you're doubting God's existing. Maybe you're too afraid to ask certain questions. Don't be afraid. 
even if you're even if you're doubting guess what bring that up to prayer talk to someone think of the intimacy that god just desires to have with you he gives us himself in the eucharist so that we can be as close as possible to be one with him to be in communion a, a union of heart of soul of mind and body maybe you you, you know you, you you all have different stories here all of you i don't know any of your stories you know maybe some of you ran away from him for such a long time and then you came back to the church like the prodigal son and some of you have been here your whole lives how do you close grow closer in friendship with christ no matter what your story is because god is waiting for you to share your your whole heart with him and he's not afraid because he cares about every single detail of your story so when it comes time for prayer what, what needs to be said what do you need to share you're also going to have time for confession 15 minutes of confession you know, maybe you've been asking God this whole Lent, you know, you know, Lord, send me a sign. Should I go to confession? Guess what? This is your sign. <laughs> go to confession. It's readily available for you. So thank you so much for taking the time just to kind of listen in, in that friendship with Christ. And I hope you bring that to prayer. Right now, I'm going to do a uh, scripture reading. And it's a reading from the book of Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every plant for food and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. What's the difference between the shoes that you're wearing on your feet tonight and the shoes that you left at home in the closet. Well, the shoes on your feet that you're wearing now were chosen, you picked them, and because of that, they're happy. And the reason why they're happy is because they're doing what they were made to do. They weren't made to be in your closet. They weren't made to be in a factory or in a shoebox. They were made to make you look good. They were made to protect your feet on a rainy night. And that's how, the same thing with humans. We're happy when we're doing what we were made to do. So what does it look like? What is the image? We were made in the image of God. That's what makes us happy. We're doing what we were made to do, to be in that image. So let's take a look at this image. So what we find tonight. You know, when Jesus was walking by the, the fishermen and saw Peter, James, and John, he said, follow me. And we all know the story. They, they left everything. And immediately, they followed him. I find that absolutely remarkable. They just met this guy and they're following him. <laughs> Well, Matthew's a tax collector. 
You know, the tax collector in the ancient world was the greatest job you could possibly have. So you sit in a nice cushy chair in front of a desk and people line up in front of you to give you money and all you have to do is just check off the box. So Jesus came and said, follow me. So Matthew said, Dad, do I, do I keep the, the, great, the best job you could possibly have in the ancient world and just, just get rich? Or do I follow this guy that I just met? <laughs> he followed Jesus. <laughs> I think I had this experience once. My prevention was, was my boss came to me and said, uh, you need to hire somebody in the office. So I lost my, my secretary retired a few years before and uh, I was kind of doing everything on my own, bulletins and he says, I, I got it, I, I got it, I can handle it. He says, no you don't, you can't handle it. He says, like the electronic bulletin that says push this, you push it and nothing happens. And then I had a delivery, I had a package come, and no one answered the door, and now I, my, my package was sent back. I said, you need somebody. I says, well, you're the boss, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll find somebody. He says, now make sure when you hire somebody, you don't just pick the first person you find. Make sure it's someone you like. I go, all right. So I put out a, a notice and bulletin and looking for help, and. Not long after that, I, I met a young professional who just graduated from college. His name was uh, Quinn Cunningham. I talked to him, I had a conversation with him for about maybe 90 seconds. In that very short conversation, I found out that he graduated from the same college that I did, that he loves scripture and uh, biblical studies, and that he runs marathons. Oh, well, I run marathons. So I said to myself, I like this guy. And so I hired him. <laughs> there were no interviews, there were no check off the boxes and qualifications. Why? Why did I hire him so fast? Chemistry. That's right. Chemistry. It's a wonderful thing. And I think that's what happened with the disciples. They saw something. It was a, a connection. It was chemistry. You know, when Mary uh, was the first person to ever see God. God is invisible. You can't see God. And God sent his son, and for the first time in human history, we can actually see God. And so Mary was the first one who saw the baby, looked into his eyes, and she must have said, God has my smile. God has my eyes. Connection. Chemistry. So then the shepherds, the shepherds worked in. They saw the baby left in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And they left rejoicing. Oh, why, why would they leave rejoicing? Because they saw that Son of God was one of them, a shepherd. Chemistry. The wise men, they went to visit and they followed the star and they saw the child wrapped with the mother in his arms. And they saw the child and they worshiped. They gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they left rejoicing as well. Why were they rejoicing? Because the Son of God was one of them. Wise man. Then Peter. So Peter met Jesus and Jesus came into his house and saw that Peter's mother-in-law was sick and Jesus cured the mother-in-law, but you didn't see Peter kneeling down and saying, depart from me, I'm a sinner. No, it came in the next chapter. It came in the next in Luke's gospel that Jesus was in the boat. And Jesus said, let's go out for a catch. So they went out for a catch, and Jesus caught so many fish that it almost sunk two boats. And that's when Peter fell on his knees. <laughs> fell on his knees and said, depart from me. Why? Because he saw that God was like him. A fisherman. Chemistry. 
My relationship with the Lord is very personal. I see Jesus as a carpenter. Oh, I'm a carpenter. Jesus loves scripture. He quoted it. I've dedicated my life studying scripture. Chemistry. Every one of us when he sees God, sees the image, we're drawn. Because we can say he's one of us. He's one of he's me. That's the connection. It's the super glue that keeps us together. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you my I'm gonna tell you my Christmas story. So here's my Christmas story. So the angels uh, appeared to the philosophers and said to the philosophers, "Hey, this uh, go and see the child wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. It's the son of God." So the philosophers went and they saw the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger, and they said, "Well, this can't be God. God is." metaphysically impossible that this is God. God has no beginning and no end. God can't be born. So they left unimpressed. So then the angels appeared to the scientists and said to the scientists, go and see the child wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger who was born of a virgin. So the scientists went and they says, it's, 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 it's biologically impossible for a virgin to give birth to a child. It's just, and so they, they left unimpressed. And then God appeared to the social workers and said to the social workers, go see the child wrapped in swaddling clothes, the savior of the world. So the social workers went and saw a child there and said, this cannot be the savior of the world. It's impossible. The child is gonna be growing up in poverty you need money, you need political influence, you need a great education to make a difference in the world. This child will not have that. So they left unimpressed, but the shepherds, the shepherds went in and they left rejoicing. They go, whoa, 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 all the time out here. How, how is it that the philosophers and, and scientists and social workers go in and they see the baby, the same thing you saw, a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, they left unimpressed. Why are you all happy? Because they said, because we know that this is God. We rejoice because he's God. Because God loves to do the impossible. <laughs> and that's the image. God wants to do the impossible with us. That's what makes us happy. You know, there's, we live, I live at St. Clement's, uh, Jorge and I, right, right next door, there used to be a parking lot of, a, that you could fit maybe 50, a very small parking lot, but they made a lot of money because Fenway Park is just down the street. Well, a developer bought that little small parking lot of 50 cars and built two skyscrapers. Now you say, that's impossible. How do you put two skyscrapers in a little spot? Well, what they did is they built the buildings over the, the Massachusetts Turnpike and some train tracks, which is ridiculously hard to do. <clears throat> you know what their motto is? Making the impossible possible. <laughs> how do you do that? How do you make the impossible possible? How do you make something that's impossible, how do you do that? Well, you surround yourself with the best. And that's what they did. They had the best architects, the best engineers, the best builders, the best safety people. They surrounded themselves with the best. You surround yourself with the right people, you can do anything. And that's why the apostles left everything to follow him. You can do anything if you have the right person around you. You know, so Moses, Moses was, uh, you know, in the wilderness and God appeared to him in the burning bush and said, hey Moses, I got a great idea. I says, all the, I hear the, all the Israelites in Egypt, they've been crying out to be delivered. Well, I'm here to deliver them. So, so God says, we're going to go in, we're going we're gonna to rescue them, we're going to bring them to the, uh, the, the desert, we're going to bring them to the promised land where there's going to be milk and honey and all kinds of wonderful things for them. And Moses uh, spent the next two chapters telling God why that's why that's not going to work. He says, are you kidding me? That, that, that's, that's ridiculous. First of all, 
I am a runaway slave with a rap sheet for murder. I can't go back into Egypt. If they do, they're going to arrest me. But let's say, for instance, they don't arrest me. They're never going to allow me to uh, see the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh. But let's say, for instance, they say, oh, that's a great idea. Let's, uh, let's go uh, show you the Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. I'm going to be standing in front of him, and I'm going to deliver your message that all their free help is going to be, you want the free help to be released? That's not going to go over very well. But let's say, for instance, he thinks that's a great idea that all of his free help leave, leave the country forever. Then we end up in a desert with no food, no water. Your plan stinks. It's not going to work. So God said to Moses, look, at, yeah, I understand. You know, I understand that if you, you're, you know, you're a slave and with a rap sheet for murder and uh, they want to arrest you as soon as you get into Egypt, but don't worry, I'll be with you. Oh yeah, you're going to go in front of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is not going to like your message. He's not going to like that at all. He's going to he's going to flex some muscle too. He's going to resist with everything he has. Ah, eh, don't worry about it. I'll be with you. Oh yeah. Oh by the way, when he does release you, he's going to send his army and his uh, chariot and chariot of tears. They are, which happens to be the, the un, an undefeated army, the most powerful army on the world that's never lost a war. And he's going to go against you guys who don't even have a butter knife to protect yourselves. Eh, don't worry. I'll be with you. Yeah, you're going to go in a desert. It's going to be uh, pretty hot and no food, no water. Eh, don't worry about it. I'll be with you. You know, the... Uh, do you believe that that's why we follow him? We were made to be with Christ and to do the impossible. You know, I don't know if you, know if you follow baseball, but uh, there was, uh, Kevin Millar was up at bat. It was the, the, uh, the, the New York Yankees were one out away from getting a free ticket to the World Series, just one out. It was the bottom of the ninth inning. Kevin Millar got up at bat. Kevin Millar, in my personal estimation, is the worst clutch hitter in the entire world. <laughs> and he is facing the greatest closer of all time, Mariano Rivera. Well, Kevin didn't get a hit, but he walked. And they replaced him. As soon as he got in the first place, they replaced him with David Roberts, who's a speedster. He's very fast, so he stole second. The next guy... Bill Millar, Bill Millar got up at bat and got a hit. So they tied the game. In the wee hours of the morning, I think it was around 2 o'clock in the morning, David Ortiz got a walk-off. In a miraculous fashion, the Red Sox won that game. They went on to win the next three games against the Yankees, and then they got the, they went to the World Series. When they got to the World Series, they won the, 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 four, the four, four games right in a row, one after the other. They won the World Series. What made it so great was not the fact that the Red Sox won the World Series for the first time in 86 years. What made it so special was the way they won it. The worst batter meets the greatest closer of all time. It's the way they won it. And that's God. God wins. We all know God wins. But it's the way God wins. In extraordinary ways. So there's Goliath, right? There's Goliath, the most trained warrior experience he is from head to toe just armor he has a sword as tall as he is with a helmet and he gets in front of little david has no helmet no protection no experience and goliath said that this is, this is an easy win But little did Goliath know that David misspent his entire youth playing video games with his slingshot. <laughs> and he was, just, he, he was killed. Goliath was killed. And David said, I did this to show the world how great God is. It's not the way God wins the battles. It's, it's, the, it's not that God wins the battle. We all know that. It's the way he wins it. It's the way he wins it. You know, I was, I had to give mass at a nursing home. My mother was in the nursing home, so they got me to say a mass once a month. 
So I got my album and I got everything ready and I go out to the, to the, you know, to get one of the cars and all the cars are gone. I go, oh no, what am I going to do? I was thinking maybe I could take the train, but that'll take two hours, be two hours late. Maybe I should call them and tell them I'm not going to be able to make it this time. So as I was in the hall inside the, inside the, uh, the house there, one of the guys came in. He says, oh, are you looking for a car? I go, yeah, I am. He says, oh, that's a, that's a really funny thing because I was at this reception after this baptism, we were having a little party, and I, and I left early. I says, I wonder if somebody needs the car. I guess I was right. You know what they call that? They call that mental apathy. They call that, uh, it's a way of just a mental telepathy. It's, that's how we guys communicate. We just think, you know, and you just uh, let it, just try to get communicate with one another. So I tried mental telepathy with our cook. I said, I was thinking, pizza. <laughs> cook, pizza. <laughs> it didn't work. Now, the reason I bring this up is because uh, this is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is uh, uh, he's short in stature, and uh, he's the uh, chief tax collector. Well, what's a chief tax collector? Well, a chief tax collector is, uh, is hired by the Romans. The Romans don't want to collect taxes. They don't want to, that's, 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 that's dirty business. They don't, they don't want to deal with that. So they hire a private company to do the work. And so Zacchaeus is the, is, is the, is the, is the CEO of this company that's going to uh, collect the taxes in this jurisdiction. Well, everybody hates him. So he climbs a sycamore tree to communicate, because he wants to communicate a message to Jesus using mental telepathy, right? So he climbs a sycamore tree. So what, what is exactly a sycamore tree? Everybody, everybody see a sycamore tree? A sycamore tree looks like it's diseased. It looks like it's sick because the bark peels off. It's got these brown blotches on it. No one likes to have it in the house because in their yard because you got to rake up the, the bark. <laughs> and it doesn't look very good at all. So the message is, I look sick to everybody. That's why everybody hates me. But I'm really healthy. And Jesus got the message. He got the message. They were connected. And Jesus was rejoicing when he, he says, I'm going to eat at your house tonight. You know, just before he met Zacchaeus, he cured a blind man in Jericho. And what Jesus did is he took away his occupation because that's how you, that's how a blind man earns his money is by begging. Well, he can't beg anymore because now he sees. Does he have any skills? Probably not. Does he have any much education? Not if he's a blind man in the ancient world. What's he have? So Jesus went a little bit further, and he got a partner who said, Zacchaeus said, I'll, I'll help, I'll spend half my fortune to give it to the, I'll help the poor. So Jesus now can go to Jerusalem to finish his mission, but he has a working partner there to help this man who just got his sight back, who has no other means of getting any money. Are we connected to God? That's the image. Are we connected? Do we believe that God can do? Are we surrounding ourselves with the best so we can do anything? You know, I love to fly fish, and uh, we a lot of times when we fly fish, we're looking for a hatch. Hatch are bugs. You know, we like to see bugs on the water. And my favorite hatch is the mayflies, mayfly hatch. So let me tell you a little bit about the mayflies. So mayflies live on the bottom of rivers and streams that are well oxygenated, water that's well oxygenated, and it's also they has uh, clean water. And every and after four years of living under the rock, crawling under there, it crawls out from underneath the rocks that they were living, and they float to the surface. As they're floating to the surface of the of the of the top of the water, they're they're getting out of what I call their wetsuit. So, and then they have their wings underneath it. So then when they get to the surface, they take their wings and they dry them out. They, they flap them and they dry them, they dry them out. And then they fly away. But they don't just fly away. What they do is they only have one day to live. They just live one day after they hatch, after they come up out of the water. What they need to do is they have to mate. So the male and the female have to mate. Then the, after they mate, the female then on the same day goes upstream and lays the eggs in the water. The eggs then will travel downstream 
sinking as they do. Now, while the, while the uh, eggs are floating downstream, the mother dies. And, but the way she dies is she spreads her wings out on the water so that the fish can see the food and take the mother and not eat the eggs. It's a remarkable thing in nature. But here's the most remarkable thing is uh, the, the eggs as they're traveling through the, through the current and they're, they're sinking, the egg will eventually land right in front of the rock that that mother crawled out. It's remarkable. It's an amazing thing. And the, the, the bugs, the, the, oh, the, the bugs. And bugs, the, 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 do, how does a bug figure out the, 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 the speed of the water and the descent of the, the, the sink rate of the egg to make it land in the right and exact spot? How do they know that? How do they do that? Well, here's my point. If God can make, get a bug to do the, that, which seems to be impossible for us, can you imagine what we can do made in God's image? You know, the, the Patriots were losing the game, and uh, it was one minute left, and Tom Brady threw an interception. They were home. They were home at Gillette Stadium. After he threw the interception, 40,000 fans got up and left before the game ended. The next day, I called my father. He says, Dad, did you watch the game? He goes, yeah. I said, what did you do when Tom Brady threw the intercession? He says, I turned the TV off and it went out and they raked leaves. 40,001 people missed out on the greatest comeback in Patriots franchise history. Somehow in that one minute, the Patriots got the ball back and Tom Brady and the boys marched down the field and got a touchdown and won that game. It's an amazing thing. And do you know why 40,000 people missed, missed out on that opportunity to see such a great comeback? It's because they didn't let Tom Brady or Bill Belichick finish the story. <laughs> and that's sometimes us. We get in the middle of the story, we go, oh, oh. we don't let God finish the story. You know, when Jesus was in the garden, it said that God sent angels to deliver a message to him. And it said that he prayed. And when I pray, I always often, I, I read the scriptures. That's where my, my greatest prayer book is, is the scriptures. You can imagine that Jesus did the same. And there's Jesus there, and he's probably went to the passage about David and Goliath. Maybe he read that, and David appeared to him and said, you know, remember me, I was, I was just a little kid when I stood in front of Goliath. I had no protection, no helmet, nothing. That was my time. That was my hour to show the world how great God was. But now it's your time. It's your hour. This is your moment. Then the three young men appeared, and they said to Jesus, you remember us in the scriptures. We were thrown in the fiery furnace that was heated up seven times over, white hot. And Nebuchadnezzar the king and all of his, his cronies were watching inside, waiting for us to be incinerated. But we weren't. We showed that king and the world at that time how great God is. Now, Jesus, it's your time. This is your hour. And then Joseph from Genesis appeared. And Joseph said, you remember me? I was a little kid when my brothers sold me into slavery, into a household. And then the wife accused me of a crime that I never committed, so I was arrested, I was thrown in jail. I remember being in that cell, hoping that dad would come and rescue me. He never came, and I cried myself to sleep. But that night, 
I had a dream. I had a dream, and I told Pharaoh the dream. You must save the food that you have collected in your harvest because it's going to be a major drought. And that dream saved the world. And I was reunited with my brothers and the whole world, and I showed the world how great God is. But this is now your time. This is your moment to show the world. That's the image. This is our time. When I was in the seminary, my first year, first semester, I went in for evaluations. My, the rector of the seminary was in, in front of the desk in front of me and he says, uh, well, we got together and we decided that we don't think that you're gonna be smart enough to continue. We think that uh, you're not going to be able to study philosophy. It's going to be too complicated for you. And uh, we're thinking of dismissing you. However, I'll give you one more semester. I'll give you one more chance to pull up your grades. I remember going into the chapel at St. Clement's and uh, I put my head down and I was devastated. I said, God, I said, I just... I th I, since I was second grade, I wanted to be a priest. So I thought this is what you put into me. I thought this is what you wanted me to be. I th did I get something wrong? Did I make a mistake? You know, it's going to be smart enough to, to, to be a priest? And God said to me, you just let me finish the story. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went on, and many, many years later, I'm driving to St. John's Seminary as the professor of of uh, classical languages and, and New Testament studies. And I was, beside me was uh, Father David Beauregard, who's also a professor there who teaches uh, 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 Catholic uh, history, Christian history. And I turned to him as I was driving to St. John's, he says, do you remember the time when I was first in the seminary when you guys wanted to kick me out because I wasn't smart enough? Do you remember that? Did you ever think once that maybe perhaps in the future that it would be you and I, the professors going to St. John's, that it was that of all your great students, of all your A students that you loved and you <laughs> bragged about, that it would be me, <laughs> of all of them. And he turned to me and he said, that was God. <laughs> and I heard God say to me, so what do you think? And I said, yeah, yeah, the story was pretty rough, but I liked the ending. <laughs> we always like God's ending. Because it's not that God doesn't win, it's the way God wins. You know, when the, Jesus died on the cross, everybody was sad. In fact, before Jesus even died on the cross, when he was arrested, even the the disciples even threw in the towel. Everybody kind of gave up. Everybody lost hope. And you know why they were sad? Because they didn't let God finish the story. But we're not going to be like that. In our discouraging moments, in our tough times in life, we're going to hear God say to us, Let me finish the story. I win, but it's the way I win. You keep me in your life. You keep me in your life. And you'll do the impossible. It's about who you surround yourself with, who is with you, who is your partner. Now I'm going to close with this thought. When my mother was diagnosed with lupus, she had to go in the nursing home because she needed 24-7 care around the clock. And I visited her frequently, and three times a week. And, and when I went there, I used to, she loved shopping, so I would take her shopping and put the wheelchair in the back of the car and off would go. So this particular day, I asked my mother, she said, so what do you want to do today? She said, I want to buy a pocketbook. I said, a pocketbook? 
I said, that, that, that's, that's got to be easy, right? It's like buying a wallet. You know, you go to the wallet <laughs> section of the store, you get the cheapest wallet, and then you go to the cash register and, and you pay for it. So what I didn't know is that in the pocketbook, they have compartments inside. So you got to take the paper stuffing out to see the compartments. So my mother, was, so I took my mother to a store and she looked at all the pocketbooks. We took all the stuffing out. So, at the, so I said, for which one do you like? She said, none of them. Can we go to another store? So we went to three stores. She finally found a pocketbook. I didn't realize they cost so much. Well, anyway, I bought the pocketbook. We went back to the nursing home. My aunt was there when we arrived. And of course, the first thing my mother did is she showed my aunt the pocketbook. She says, um, and she said, oh, Peter, what a nice pocketbook you bought your mother. Isn't that nice? It's a very, this is, ooh, this is a really good pocketbook. I go, yeah, 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 I guess. And then, she, then my aunt said this to me. She says, oh, Peter, if I could only have my mother back for five minutes, just five, I'd mortgage the house sell the car and buy her the most beautiful necklace. Oh, to see her smile again. She said, Peter, you keep doing what you're doing. Oh, you still have her. One week later, my mother died. Now I know why she wanted a pocketbook. She was going on a very special trip. <laughs> but my aunt's words then became my words. If I could only have her back for just five minutes. Think about that. The things you can do, the joy you can squeeze out of life in just five minutes. Five minutes from now, Jorge's going to uh, have exposition. I'm going to kneel there. I'm going to be right before my Lord, my image, my chemistry. Then five minutes, the next five minutes, I'm going to hear confessions. And, you know, we priests, we get to be at the most important part of people's lives. It's the most privileged time of a priest. It's to be able to hear what some people will never tell anybody else. We get to be there. And then another five minutes after that, I'm gonna have a nice meal because I haven't eaten all day and I ran 13 miles today. <laughs> five minutes at a time. The joy you can get out of five minutes. You know, so a lot of us, we priests, we're, we like to look at the future. You know, we're always looking at the goals and plans. You know, we wanna, Bigger parish house, uh, better organ, or <laughs> better systems. And, and we get so caught up in the future that sometimes we forget to enjoy the opportunity of the now. Not me. So this has been my personal message. My mission in life is to tell people love now. Be kind now. Be slow to anger, rich in kindness now. Reconcile now. All the things that God does, that's our image, that's what makes us happy. now because we'll never, never have this moment again.